here there is some history, but not only history. I do not want to be very boring, so I choose something from our history, which is representative for symbols and signs called today branding the nation or branding a country. So uh, during the past two millennia, since the, consist uh, the consistent written sources have been preserved, the European ethno-linguistic communities have had signs and symbols to distinguish themselves and to mark their existence before other communities. Here you have an image of the main European languages uh, and these languages are correspond corresponding roughly with the ethnical uh, map of Europe. You have Indo-European Indo branch because according to specialists, around 90% of European languages are Indo-European languages and we have three general branches. Germanic languages, Slavic languages, and Romance or Romanic languages. So it's not so uh, easy to notice here, but somewhere here it's a Romanian group, there it's a French group. Being a part of Romance, of Romance uh, languages. The present day nations in Europe are, uh, were formed around the year 1000. So we can speak a, a French, Italian, Spanish, or Romanian people starting with the second millennium. Here it's easier to notice, the whole, the whole branch of Romance languages, among them it's situated Romanian language. Today in the world, according to statistics, the most numerous population having the same language as mother tongue is Spanish, not English, not Chinese, it's Spanish. So a Romance language, it's the most expanding language in the world as a mother tongue. Romanians are the unique hair of Eastern Roman world. I would say that during Middle Ages, at the beginning of Middle Ages, many peoples existed in Eastern Europe speaking Romance languages. All of them step by step disappeared and today the unique hair of this Eastern Romance or Romanic world are Romanians. This is a map of present day Romania and the University of Cluj-Napoca is situated in this place. The university is counting today 40,000 students and 21 colleges or faculties. So I, I'll give you the air, the, the, the surface of Romania, which is roughly the same as the surface of United Kingdom and Northern Ireland, almost the same area. Uh, and with 21 million inhabitants, it's the largest uh, nation in Southeastern Europe. Romanians were born according to a recipe studied by scholars, which is a recipe valuable for all Romanic or Romance nations. Three, mainly three, ethnic and linguistic elements. The most important for all of, this, of these nations is the conquering element, the Roman Empire, who put a very strong seal all over Europe 2,000 years ago.
these personal traits of Romanians are, for example, um, these isolations, Idol isolation of Romanians. I, uh, you know that French people, it's is situated in the neighborhood of Provençals. Provençals are situated near Catalans. Catalans near Spanish. Spanish near Portuguese. Italians all in the same region. Romanians are surrounded mainly by other uh, family type of populations, mainly Slavic population. And this is uh, important. Another, another uh, pe peculiar thing is that during Middle Ages, Romanians didn't have as a language of the church and of education, of higher education and the language of diplomacy, Latin, as it was in the Western uh, part of Europe, but Slavonic language, which is another peculiar thing. And they didn't use, until modern times, Latin alphabet, but Slavonic alphabet. So it was a unique Romance language which use another type of alphabet, not the Latin one, until modern times. And it's a unique uh, Romance la a nation who lived around 40 decades of communism during recent times. These are the stages of our history, not, it's not very important. Now, I, I start with the symbols. For, for Romanians, ancient symbols are the Dacian kings, main Decebalus, and the Roman emperor Trajan, which is the, the first Roman emperor born outside Rome, I would say in Spain, near Sevilla. It was a, an old colony called Italica at that time. So Trajan, it's more known in Romania than in Italy because he is considered like a father of the nation, because 2,000 years ago, he had the idea to conquer the present day Romania and to transform it in a Roman province. This here is a symbol, the first symbol of this Dacia, who is um, a wolf, a head of wolf, and the snake's body. During Middle Ages, the first symbols, officially symbols, were um, the Aquila, and it was a symbol of the thousand Romania organized that time in a principality called Wallachia. You can see an uh, Aquila and a cross. Again, the same symbol uh, in, in the wall of a monastery situated in the in the southern Romania. The symbol of the second Romanian province, Moldova, Moldavia, was a head of um, aurochs or a bison, European bison, a kind of bovideus, you can see, with a star, with a star between uh, other examples of this symbol. This is a symbol of the third Romanian province, Transylvania, which was a kind of principality, in fact, the voivodeship of Hungary during Middle Ages, the most, the most um, um, important symbol was this kind of crown and seven, seven towers, which are the symbol of seven citadels or seven cities founded around the middle of Middle Ages by Saxon or German colonists. That explains why Romania has today a German uh, ethnic uh, president with a German background. Because he is uh, the heir of the former German colonists arrive on the territory of Romania almost 800 years ago. You can see different coat of arms and symbols of Middle Ages. This is one of the most important palaces from Middle Ages in a kind of Gothic style situated 
always in Transylvania and belonging to a very famous family, Romanian-Hungarian family. One of the representatives of this family was king of Hungary under the name of Matthias Corvinus. He was um, living in this castle situated in the middle of Transylvania. Another symbol, mainly um, very strong and valuable, valid until today, is Dracula. Dracula was a prince not of Transylvania. This is only a kind of prejudice. He was a prince of Wallachia. And I would say that he never had strong ties with Transylvania. But because of, a, of an Irish-British, uh, Irish-English writer called Bram Stoker, he became very famous because in, in his novel, Stoker, Stoker placed Dracula in Transylvania. And in spite of all historians who tried to correct this, the force of literature is stronger than the force of history. So he is perceived as a Transylvanian, but he was a Wallachian and a very good prince. He fought against Turks during 15th century. And because it was a time of the holy war for Christians in that time too, um, he was very praised by the, by the Pope because he was able to kill during one single battle more than 20,000 enemies, naturally not Christian. And he was praised because he was a hero of Christian world. But it was, I repeat, 15th century. The famous Dracula. This is, this is the image of the real Dracula. And you know actors and more than 150 movies were done in Hollywood mainly about the history of Dracula. All of them fictions naturally, but very interesting. Uh, another coat of arms for the first time symbols of the three Romanian principalities, Wallachia, Moldavia, and Transylvania, were put together around 1600 when it was supposed to build the modern Romania. It wasn't yet the time, but there is a, a, an image of modern Romania. In the Western uh, imaginary, there are different symbols of Romania. Here is the first Romanian prince during 19th century who created another symbol and the birth of modern Romania, it's actually 19th century, when, when Italy and Germany were born quite in the same way, less or more. Here are king and queen of Romania. At the beginning of 20th century, the king was a member of the house of Hohenzollern, Zingmaringen from, Ger from Germany, and the queen was a niece of Queen Victoria of Great Britain and of Emperor Nicholas of, of Russia, the emperor who was killed during the, after the revolution, the so-called revolution, Bolshevik revolution in 1917. The present day symbols of Romania, it's a flag and the national anthem, Awaken the Romanian, who was written uh, at the middle of 19th century. New symbols of communist Romania. The symbol of communist party everywhere in every communist party was similar. And uh, the, the coat of arms of Romania invented completely during the communist regime according to the interest of the regime for economy, agriculture, industry, and everything. Naturally, the most important person in Romania was a dictator, Ceausescu, who was perceived at the beginning as a democratic and pro-West communist. It wasn't like that, but at the beginning it was like that. He was received in London by the queen and carried uh, with, with the queen in the same, uh, in the same, Galeasca nu vine aminte. Poate știu colegii români de aici. It's an Carriage, carriage. Uh, this is a, another uh, vision of the symbol of Romania during communist regime. But for, for the regular population, for the common population, 
in, in spite of the efforts of the regime to impose symbols, the most important symbols were, for example, Nadia Komanec, an, uh, a gymnast, the first gymnast in the world who succeeded at Montreal in 76 to obtain a 10 as a mark at gymnastics. She is still alive and a former soccer um, um, player, Gheorghe Agi. But for Romanians, mainly the symbols and for intellectuals are the uh, writers and artists. For example, Eminescu is the most important poet. Enescu, the most important musician. Emil Choran, Mircea Eliade, philosophers, uh, historians of, the, of religion, and so on. Um, another symbol was a so-called Romanian revolution in 1989, where all over the world circulated a flag like that, because the old coat of arms of Romania was removed because it was a symbol of communism. And the flag remained like that during the, the days of the revolution. Naturally, there is a huge difference. This is the present uh, day flag of Romania and the present day coat of arms uh, with, with symbols. For example, Moldavia, Wallachia, Transylvania, all, all Romanian uh, uh, historical provinces. You have to know that for Romanians, as for Hungarians, Bulgarians, Serbians, Poles, and so on, it is a difference of perceiving citizenship and nationality. For example, it's, of, it's, it's not uh, correct, politically correct, for example, to say that in Romania, someone who is having as a mother tongue Hungarian is Romanian. He is Romanian citizen. But as a nationality, he is Hungarian. It's the same for a Bulgarian living abroad or for a Serbian living abroad. For example, in Romania, we have, uh, uh, according to the last census, around 30,000 Serbs. Serbs are belonging to the Serbian nation, historically speaking, in spite of the fact that they are Romanian citizens. Another peculiar thing is that around 20% of Hungarians living in Romania, and in Romania, Hungarians represents today 6% of the whole population of the country, 20% of Hungarians have double citizenship, Hungarian and Romanian, in the same time, double documents. When they are circulating abroad, they are free to show a Romanian or a Hungarian passport which is another peculiar thing. The main uh, elements of identification in, in this part of Europe, and for Romanians too, the first one and the strongest is the language. It's not the case in, in, in Western Europe, but in Eastern Europe always, a Romanian or a Hungarian or a Serbian must compulsory speak Romanian, Hungarian, or German. Uh, another Oh, excuse me. Uh, another element is uh, the origin. Another one is uh, it's, um, um, the language, the origin, the history, the tradition, and the church. You can see the former pope, John Paul II, and the patriarch of Romania, because Romanians, again, are the unique Romanic, Romance people being Orthodox or Eastern Orthodox, not Catholic. Some images which are stronger symbols of Romania. For example, we have a very strong wooden tradition of building and the famous palace of the parliament called in Romania, in Romania before the People's House, built by Ceausescu it's the second largest building in the world after the Pentagon. So it's like, uh, it's, uh, it's like uh, um, it, it wasn't loved by Romanians because a lot of Romanians were sacrificed, first of all, from a material point of view. 
when the regime decided to build this huge and unnecessary palace. Another symbol, it's a Romanian shirt for ladies. Mainly you can see some, uh, some uh, examples which inspired even the house's uh, fashion all over the world recently. So uh, I will finish telling you that there are two kind, at least two kinds of symbols everywhere, not only uh, regarding Romania. Official <coughs> symbols, which are used by officials, and non-official symbols, which are used by common world. So um, I'm sure that very few people are able to, to recognize Romanian anthem, but an image of uh, Dracula is stronger than everything. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Rector Ion Aurel, um, for this very interesting presentation on Romanian's history and nation branding. And I think it's always impressive to see how much the Romanian culture and history is linked with European countries, especially their neighbor countries. Um, I would give the floor to question and answers right now, if that's OK for you. Yes. And um, yes, there is already a question back there. Thank you very much. I'm very interested in this difference between nationality and citizenship. So my first question is uh, if this difference was already in the Austro-Hungarian Empire or it's something that's... Always. Uh, it, it was uh, almost always in modern times in this part of Europe. Okay. Austro-Hungarian Empire existed only 51 years in history, but from 1867 to 1918. So during this period sure. of five yeah. decades, the difference between nationality and, and, and uh, citizenship or it was very, very strong okay. in the empire. But even before that, during, during 18th century, during 17th century, it was a difference between political belonging to a space and the ethnic and linguistic identification of someone. It was everywhere like that because it's a region of uh, uh, large empires this region of Europe. So it wasn't the will of people to live in Russia or in Ottoman Empire or in Austrian and Austro-Hungarian Empire. It was a wish of leaders and nations created a different way of, of identity. Thank you. And the second question is, uh, which, uh, OK, you say that the passport follow both the, identity, the citizenship and uh, the nationality. And what about other rights, like for example, um, if I am national or citizens of Romania, I always have the same right, for example, as adopting children or like civil rights? It's uh, normal. Romania, it's a part of European Union. So our legislation is completely European. Not only today, it was uh, after the fall of the communist regime. We worked very hard and we succeeded to do it. Uh, Professor Pushkash, our former minister, minister uh, he deal, dealt very well with European uh, community in order to adjust our legislation to the European necessity. So there are not differences officially. For example, in my university, a, a Hungarian born in Romania and being a Romanian citizen, it's free to study from kindergarten until the university, everything completely in Hungarian, completely. The unique obligation is to study in school two times a week Romanian language because it's a language of the mother tongue of 90% of Romanians. In Romania, 90% of the population, according to the last census, is ethnically Romanian, and 10% minorities. The strongest minority is a uh, uh, Hungarian minority. I, I told you 6%, while the third one is a Roma minority, almost 3%. Roma minority, it's a, it's a historical minority 
came from India in Romanian principalities during 14th and 15th century, from northern India. And it's very easy to notice that because some of them are still preserving the language, and the language, it's a northern Indian dialect, or some, of, some northern Indian dialects. And we have records. The first Roma group came in Romania was in 1385. And the first one in Rome, for example, mentioned it's 1422. So they were able to spread all over Europe in a very short period of time. In Romanian principalities, because the life was a little bit more quiet and the progress wasn't so quick, they were able to preserve their customs, their language, in spite of the fact that until 19th century, they were slaves of Romanian nobles. And when slavery was abolished in the States, quite in the same time, Romanian leaders were obliged to abolish uh, the gypsy or the Roma slavery in Romania. Please. Uh, well, I, j I just have a very brief comment because I, I like uh, you know I like history and languages and so on and origins and I I saw that you distinct the the language in three branches. Let's let's see. And yeah, just to just it, just it, to it's only a rough. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, in Europe, I mean, but in Europe. Europe, but the point is like it's just to uh, satisfy my curiosity yeah. because I am living in Spain, in Barcelona, but I'm not going to talk about this. There is another language that I didn't see in the graphic that uh, it's very curious because nobody knows where it comes from. It is spoken also in France. Is the Basque language. That nobody, 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 nobody know. I think nobody is able to tell you in this very moment, in a precise way, which, which is the meaning of this language. We are not able, as specialists, to put this language in a kind of model. Because Basque language is one of the oldest languages, according to my opinion, in Europe. It's pre-Indo-European, before Indo-European language. I'm not sure that today I spoke with my, my colleagues. I'm teaching Latin, so I, I am a little bit found with history of languages. But Basque, it's something very peculiar. It's about a very small group, you know. Just to finish, the, do you know the, um, the, um, the legend of, Abe uh, of Alex and Asterix? They said that they were a town in France. The, my theory is that they were not French. They were the Basque, the Basque population. Of course. It's functioning or not? Yes. They were a special kind of slaves, and they were allowed to move even during that period of time, uh, during Middle Ages. How? Uh, uh, after participating to, to the main uh, agricultural works, they were free to go and to come back. They were not quite nomadic. They were uh, going to some places and coming back to their masters uh, when, the, when the winter came because they were not accustomed with uh, winter. So they, need, they, need to be, they needed to be back. And during the winter, they stayed. During the spring, they worked a little bit, and they were free to go back and to come. So it was a kind of pen, pendulare, I don't know how to say it. Like, a pen, like oscillating, yes. But definitely, their statute their status of being slaves influenced their lives until today. And that's why they're, they're, they, they are so uh, not adapted to European way of being, because 
most of them until 19th century was, were illiterate. They didn't have the chance to study, to go to schools, so they were free to preserve their traditions, but this with a huge social cost, costs. That's why today they are, most of them, not adapted to, to our present day life they have different perceiving of justice, for example. They were saying, if something it is not, uh, it is not uh, 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 survived in the street, it belonged to them. For example, a chicken in the street. For their way of thinking, it's belonging to no one. So they are free to take it. The way of marrying children, it's something which is coming from their history. For example, to marry a boy tw uh, 12 years old and a girl 8 years old, it's something normal for them, for their way of, even if the European uh, laws are punishing this kind of, of, uh, of um, behavior, you know. So we are trying very hard in Romania with ONGs and other kind of organizations to convince them to live according to European rules, but in the same time not to hurt their traditions and their way of being. And it's not very easy to do it. So uh, um, I, I thank you so much. Uh, I would allow one question if that's okay. Yes. One more question, yes. because this lady has been asking for please. the question for a long time. After that, we ha will have a panel discussion where uh, Mr. Ian O'Reilly is going to stay. So you, can, you have the chance to ask the questions Thank after you. the panel discussion, OK? Thank you very much for your uh, this Romanian history. For uh, As a non-European, it was quite informative for me. Um, the only one thing which I can relate to is the Dracula. And I grew up uh, um, uh, listening and hearing that all kind of a horror image related to the Dracula. What is the reason? Because uh, you have presented him yes. as a prince of Romania. He was a prince of Romania, but it was a very bloody time. It was a period, a, a very, a very warrior period, that period of time. And he had a custom encouraged by the general vision of 15th century to punish their enemies mainly non-Christian enemies, by impaling them. So it was called in Romanian Vlad the Impaler. And this way of being so bloody created a long of legends not during his life. After, after uh, the, his death, and uh, uh, this was according to the taste of, of a certain public, it was something exciting. So when, when a, a medieval chronicle wrote he was thirsty of blood, they took this literally. <laughs> thirsty of blood for a modern uh, writer or a modern uh, intellectual meant that he was able to drink blood. But it wasn't like that, you know. Uh, Bram Stoker and London at the end of in 19th century when Jack the Ripper lived in London and it was like a very special atmosphere. Uh, it was easy to write a novel telling scaring stories. And then the Saxons, I mean the Saxons from Transylvania were able to spread this kind of legend and but mainly according to my opinion everything started with this custom of impaling people which was quite bloody and unusual for us. But in, in the Middle East, Middle East, during Middle Ages, impaling was a very normal way of punishing people according to the law. And he was only an imitator. He didn't invent it this way of punishing people. Because of that, and then Hollywood and everything, it's important. That, uh, Nosferatus and Count Dracula, he wasn't Count. Everything uh, was invented, but he is related to Carpathians. And Carpathians are situated mainly, not only, mainly in Romania. And there are a lot of castles today called Castle of Dracula, in spite of the fact that Dracula never and was today, there. Today, it's very popular the story of Queen Hungarian, 
a Hungarian countess. The same idea. She was bloody, she wanted to, to kill people and to use the blood to take a bath and things like that. It was during 15th and 16th century. Okay, thank you thank very you. much. Uh <laughs>